best-selling author, Dr. Mary Neal. She was underwater for almost 30 minutes and came face-to-face -face with God and ready to tell about it. So, welcome, Doctor. Nice to well, have thank you. Thank you. It's but, my privilege. Well, first question, 30 minutes is a long time to be under 10 feet of water. How, how do you survive that, not have any brain damage? Well, my kids would say that I probably did have brain damage, but <laughs> <laughs> the fact is that um, that's one of the reasons why I would say that my experience really is beyond science. Tell us what happened in America that day. day. Well, we were in Chile, in South America, kayaking on a river that's well known for its waterfalls. And I don't mean Niagara Falls. I mean drops of 15 to 20 feet, which for a kayaker is exhilarating and challenging, but certainly within our skill set. Mm -hmm. And there were some circumstances that made it so that I had to go over the main part of the waterfall. And I was in a kayak, and when I hit the bottom of the waterfall, uh, the front of the boat became pinned or stuck in the rocks and the underwater features. And so the boat and I were then completely submerged under eight or 10 feet of water. Were you able to get out of your kayak at that point or no. you were stuck in it? <laughs> no, I was absolutely pressed to the front deck of the boat. And this was a river with tremendous volume, tremendous force. And so I couldn't do anything. I couldn't move my arm even an inch, let alone pull my spray skirt off or push out of the boat or do any of those things. Did you panic? No. I always feared a drowning death, but one of the remarkable things, and I'm a spine surgeon, so I'm a very calm person anyway, and being underwater was not something I was not familiar with. I mean, it's part of kayaking, but it was really the first of what was many wonderful parts of this experience because I immediately started to do the things that would either free the boat or free me. Such as what? Oh, jiggling the boat and trying to pull the spray skirt off, but it was clear to me that nothing was gonna make a difference. And I'm a very pragmatic, concrete thinking sort of person and I knew how far from shore I was. I knew that even if someone could get to me, they weren't gonna be able to pull me out of the boat and rescue me. I, I have seen people drown on the river. And did you, at that point, too, from what I learned about, your legs were broken, and you felt your legs being... Broken. Well, it took a while to get to that point, but the first thing I did really was give up trying to control the outcome. And I asked that God's will be done, and I really meant it. And the moment that happened, I was immediately uh, embraced with a very physical sensation of being held and comforted by Christ, and told that everything would be fine, regardless of whether I lived or died. And yes, as my body was so slowly sucked over the front deck of the boat by the current, my knees bent back on themselves and broke, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I, my little thought balloon off to the side was thinking, gosh, that, that felt like a bone. This is not this good. This is not good. <laughs> but as that happened, my spirit sort of peeled away from my body, and when my body broke free from the boat, my spirit rose up and out of the river. And what did you see? It was... Wonderful. There were many things. Uh, I was greeted by a group of people, spirits, beings. I'm never really quite sure what to call them because those names mean different things to different people. But they had known me and loved me as long as I've existed, and I knew and loved them. And they were overjoyed to welcome me and greet me and guide me. And, and it was a funny thing because I could be with them and simultaneously look back at the river and see the guys pull my body to the river bank and start CPR. And, and it was only then that I was surprised by several things. One, I was surprised that I was dead. Uh, but then the other two things that were really surprising to me was that uh, I had this overwhelming sense of being home, of there, being where I really belonged and where we, we all really belonged. And, and I also looked at my body and I could recognize that it was me. It represented my life here on Earth, and I had a great life. I still have a great life. There was nothing I was trying to escape, and I was surprised that when I looked at it, um, I had no intention of coming back. Well, and I had four young children. Yeah, I had yeah. children yes. and a husband. <laughs> and did you have those feelings or thoughts about them at all? I did, but I had been reassured that they would be fine, and that was one of the things that was surprising to me because I had every reason to come back. And despite that, in contrast to this overwhelming 
all pervasive love of God, I had no desire to. Can I, um, can I revisit something that you said? And I just want to get, so we move forward from here. You were underwater for 30 minutes, right? Yes. And you said that there was one point you said, I'm just going to release what the outcome is going to be and give over to Christ. Right. Had you had, had, up to that point, had you been a faithful walk? Did right, you yeah. have a close relationship with God at all? Were you I think one of the beautiful things about my experience or my story is that I think I was very typical. I grew up as a child in the 1950s, and my parents took me to Sunday school, but it was sort of a Sunday morning thing, and then you go back to your life. Mm -hmm. And then I went to college and medical school and residency and had a husband and a kid and a kid and another kid, and they kept coming and coming, and, uh, and who has time for spiritual life? And I would say that before this accident, I absolutely would have said I believed in God. And I certainly hoped that there was something more and thought there probably was. And I certainly tried to be a good person, tried to be kind and compassionate and, and those sorts of things. But I, I don't think anyone would have claimed that I was particularly religious. I took my own kids to, to Sunday school. Mm -hmm. and I tried to be a better parent to them than, mm -hmm. than perhaps mine had been to me. But... Well, well, we're going to step away for a commercial, but on the other side, when we come back, I want to find out what work you still had to do here, why you were set back, uh, and a million other questions. And the, uh, and the answer is quite surprising. Yeah, it, it really is. Uh, yeah. Go for it. Just to, you know, you held under, you were down underwater for 30 minutes, you broke your legs, you, uncommon, you have this out of body. How, I mean, you're here today. How, yeah. how are you? Is there long lasting repercussions of this? Well, your body never heals without some scar. Right. So my knees aren't perfect, but I still kayak and I ski and I do all sorts of things. The human body is a miraculous organism. So, Take us through, you, you, you're there, um, you're out of body, you're watching them work on you, and you meet God? Well, we, uh, I was taken down this incredibly beautiful path, exploding with color, and I believe that God speaks to each of us in the ways that we will understand and respond, and for me, color and aromas like flowers are really um, important. And so this path was just exploding with every color of the rainbow and beyond of an intensity that was really inexplicable. It's a, it was as though I could experience the color and the aromas and this absolute pure, unconditional love of God. I mean, the love was beyond anything that, that we can experience here. And we were going down to this great dome structure of sorts that I knew was the point of no return. And I could hardly wait to get there. And we eventually arrived on the threshold and spent what seemed like many hours. And it was this time of complete understanding. It, it was as though all I had to do was wonder about something and I had a total understanding of everything. I mean, you were told that you needed to go back. I was. I kept trying to crawl my way across this threshold. Then eventually, I was told that I, it wasn't my time, and I had more work to do on Earth, and I had to go back to my body. And so I did what any reasonable person would do and say, no, yeah. <laughs> I'm here. I'm not leaving. Uh, but I, I, obviously, I'm here, so I lost that argument. But I was Did you given. feel connected to your children and your family and want to go back to them? No. And that was one of the things that that held me back from talking about my experience for a number of years because to your family. Yes. Yeah. Because my children are very young and I never wanted them to think they weren't enough of a reason. But in contrast to God's love and to being where we all belong, this is just a very brief journey in time. So this experience, so you, you sat down and you started to, to write, you, you 
felt after 10 years had gone by, they knew we were going to sit down and write about this experience. When I was sent back to my body, I was sent back with a number of tasks I still had to do and a number of expectations. One had to do with the coming death of my oldest son and the expectations of my response and my sort of behavior at that time and helping people see the beauty in not only his life but his death. And then the other really was this mandate to share my experiences with other people. Well, let's just go back one second because uh, from what I read, you, you, God told you that your son was going to pass. Am I, is that correct? Yes. Okay. I mean, you never, obviously you never said anything to your husband or to your family, but you knew his death was coming. You didn't know when. I, I never said anyone to anyone until shortly before my son's 18th birthday, because I had thought that that was sort of the deadline. And at a certain point, I felt that it wasn't fair not to tell my husband in case he had something he wanted to say. And so I did tell him. And then when my son's 18th birthday came, I actually told him about it because I thought that we had sort of passed the window. And there were some things that made me think the plan for his life had changed. So, wow, there's so much here. Yeah. You know, he's sitting like, head around. Yes. Um, but she was writing, you were writing uh, the, an article, or you were writing what had happened to you, and the day that you finished. Well, I knew that I had this mandate to share my experiences with other people, oh. and in sharing with other people, really helping people make this transformation from a hope or faith that the promises of God are true to an absolute trust. And I knew that writing was really one of the aspects of that, but it's not something I wanted to do. None, none of this is in my comfort zone, and so I put it off and put it off and put it off. And then one day, it was as though I was picked up out of bed, put down, and said, okay, now, today is a day you're going to say yes, and you're going to do this. And I said, okay. And I wrote it all down very quickly, and then made some revisions. And the day that I saved the final, final, final version of the manuscript for this book, I felt incredibly light and... I was so joyful, and it was a few hours later that my son was killed. In a car accident? Well, he was hit by a car. He was roller skiing. He was uh, ski training, and he was hit by a car by a distracted driver. Now, because of what, this is so terrible, I'm so sorry, but because you went through this experience, did it help you cope with the loss of your son? Or you, there is no know? question that, I mean, I still feel great sadness. I love of him deeply, but there is no question that I know that his death was part of the plan for his life, for our life, for the world. One of the things that happened when I was still underwater is that uh, we went through a little bit of a life review, looking not at events in isolation, but looking at the beauty that came out of every event. If you look at that event 25, 30, 35 times removed. And so I know absolutely that there's incredible beauty that comes out of every event. So when I think about my oldest son's death, I may not be able to answer the question of, well, why? Mm -hmm. And I may not have the ability, and I think that's one of our challenges, is to not always need the answer to the question of why. So I may not be able to say, well, why? Where, where's all the beauty? I want to see it. But through this transformation, I have an absolute trust that there is beauty there regardless of whether I can see it. So you have, you through this experience and you have enough faith and, and trust in God that you know that your son is in a good place and he's safe and he's happy. I know that he is where he really belongs and I'll did. see him, you know, eventually. Did he cross the threshold? He did and he didn't want to come back either, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, so you, Mary. much. The story is so insightful and inspirational. Um, don't forget to pick up Heaven and Back, available in bookstores now or online. And for more information, visit uh, Mary C. Neal, uh, MD, go to our website, homartel.com forward slash home and family. Go to uh, drmaryneal.com for more information. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 Sophie, you have, you, you'll be selling or following that. Oh, I can't imagine. I'd love